All right, so today I want to take a look at a workflow for Fusion 360 called, uh, called Master Modeling. Um, and this is something that I've used quite a bit outside of Fusion 360 and, and I'm starting to use in Fusion 360 uh, to solve some of the shortcomings that I've come across otherwise. Um, and so I think it's important when you're looking at what Master Modeling is or if you should be using it, uh, uh, first let's take a look at some of the things that it does or that it, uh, some of the problems that it solves. Um, so one is if you've, if you've ever worked in this top-down single assembly method, uh, you, you might find that you've built an assembly that's kind of like this one where uh, it has a pretty long history. It's all built in the same assembly. You know, you have a bunch of components that can kind of help that, that history tree. Um, but maybe you weren't very disciplined and as you're building the thing, it, it changed shape a little bit or, uh, you know, maybe you worked on one component a little bit, worked on another component, built some references off of, off of the other component, continued building it, and you wind up kind of in this, uh, this shape where you just have an assembly that's, um, like I said, not, not very well disciplined. It, uh, it would be pretty difficult for me to make a change early on here. It would cause something to fail later down the line and I'd probably need to uh, invest considerable time kind of untangling the web of references that's going on here. Um, so that's, that's not a fault really of Fusion. It's kind of a fault of how I built this. I, I did it in a pretty short period of time. Uh, on a plane and uh, was just really kind of looking to get the idea down on paper. Um, and, I, and as a result of that, I didn't follow good discipline and I wind up in this position with a, a pretty, uh, pretty unreliable model. So that's something that, that master modeling can really help with is that it sort of forces you into a disciplined, uh, a disciplined way of working that uh, avoids any possibility of that happening or, or should really avoid the, the possibility of that happening. Um, probably really the, the, the second one and the, the primary thing that drives people to this is that uh, maybe you want to collaborate with a, another, with a team all on this project. And, and this one's not a great example, but uh, say for whatever reason you wanted a, a single person or, or you wanted to, to distribute this out and have somebody work on the body, somebody work on the pocket clip, somebody work on the advancing mechanism uh, and this, this button, right? And, uh, uh, obviously having it all in one file doesn't really work because you can't simultaneously all work on the same file uh, this time. That's kind of a, a technical limitation. And then, um, so then your other method would be maybe to use uh, sort of a bottom up methodology where you start each component fresh and you, you know, make the body and then uh, somebody else starting from scratch makes this advancing mechanism. And that doesn't really work here either because uh, you can't really this thing has some some uh, some dependencies on each other. There's uh, a pocket here that's defining the shape of the uh, outside of the pocket clip. Uh, this thing travels a certain amount and that sort of defines how big this cutout is and that's also related to the length of this slot. Uh, and that slot sort of shares some geometry with this button and and with the advancing mechanism. Uh, so there's there's a lot of things there that screw up working from bottom up as well. And this, this is this is a very low complexity project. So you can imagine if you were working on something like a motorcycle or a car or something that uh, that that would become far more important. So sort of bottom up doesn't really allow you to have references. Top down doesn't really allow you to disperse it out into multiple uh, into multiple parts very well, right? So uh, you kind of need something that lands in the middle of those. Um, and uh, there's also one other thing that I think a lot of people run into, which is that if you use this existing structure here and you sort of combine everything all into, uh, into one assembly, what you wind up with at the end of the life of the project uh, as you start kind of um, uh, starting to move into maybe machining parts or having parts made or something, uh, you maybe don't want all of your CAM data for each part all living within this one assembly. Uh, maybe there's fixtures that go with uh, making each part. Uh, the, the assembly can just kind of start ballooning there and uh, you wind up with, you know, say this, this thing's taking three operations and two fixtures in order to make this pocket clip and, uh, you know, uh, for whatever reason you're doing the milling here as a separate thing and you just wind up with a whole bunch of instances of things like vices and fixtures and stuff that really just make this... Uh, this assembly gigantic. So, so that's kind of a, a not, not good workflow. And there's not really a great way to push files from here out into another, uh, into another assembly and maintain parametrics. I mean, I, I've, I've, I think I've shown some ways to do that. So it's not, 
insurmountable, but it, but it could be cleaner and the master modeling technique is just going to inherently break this stuff up into individual components to start with. So, um, so that can help. Um, so I think it's easiest now that we have that premise, especially the one of the collaboration where bottom up has one set of problems. You can't really have uh, interactions between parts or shared references. Top down has the inability to collaborate. If you focus on those two things, it, it, those are really the uh, the two things that combine to create the master modeling technique. Um, so let's pop into the master model and, and take a quick look. Uh, one thing is that this is a, a pretty simplified version of a master model and that we're, we're avoiding making components in here where we could use surfaces, but we're not going to be able to use those surfaces to do things like trims later on. Um, that's sort of context. If you already know what master modeling is and you're applying it to fusion, those are maybe some limitations that you'd care about. Uh, if this is your first time seeing this, let's just, uh, let's just focus on what there is here. Um, in this case, I have a, a, a pen refill that's being provided by the manufacturer and that's being used to drive some of the basic geometry in here. Uh, but it's sort of a static thing that we know is not going to change. So it's, it's included in the master model. We can shut that off for a second and see what we're left with. Uh, so what we're left with is just a bunch of, of, of sketches with profiles. Um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll define in the master model the uh, minimum amount of data to, uh, that needs to be shared amongst components. So you can see there's really not a whole lot in here. There's basically some, some basic forms in here. There's some, some sizing and diameters. Um, in reality, I actually have some information in here that maybe shouldn't be a part of the master model because it's really kind of just an interaction of this refill to the body. Um, maybe some of that shouldn't be in here, but uh, it's in here because of, uh, of kind of the way that parameters work in Fusion. Um, so those things are easy. I wanted to kind of consolidate things that are being driven with parametrics uh, into the master model as well. Um, but you can see like the, the size of the slot, the position of the slot, all of that stuff's being driven here. Um, you can start to see the basic form of the, of the button that we're going to be using, um, the basic form of the advancing mechanism itself, the uh, outside silhouette of the body, kind of the main pocket in the body, and the main pocket in the, uh, in the advancing mechanism that's going to form the basis also of the pocket clip. Um, so that's really all that winds up in here. And, and from this, if you wanted to do just a standard top down, I mean, this might be the, the, the basis of your, uh, if you were more disciplined and better, you could start building this assembly off of, off of the same information. And this is probably a, I mean, this is a significantly better structure than what I wound up with here. Right. Um, in this case, I'll just show that I'm using parameters to drive most of this. Uh, most of this geometry here, which keeps it nice and parametric and, uh, and easily con consolidated into one place. Um, and so the basis is this, is this is the shared geometry, right? And uh, then the key here is that for each component that we make, we're going to insert this geometry into that component and create the component uh, using this geometry as the basis to define it. Um, and so just to show that kind of in practice, um, it uh, looks like I, I already tried this once, so let's go ahead and delete this back. Maybe that already showed you what's going on here, but uh, what we'll do is we're just going to pop into the data panel. We're going to insert our master model into the new component. Click OK. We're going to make an as-built joint that locks it in place. Uh, rigid. Uh, and then from there, that's when we would start uh, actually building our component, right? We'd start, if say we're making this little button, uh, we can come in here, we can do a revolve, we can make a new component with this revolve, we can grab a couple of our profiles and our axis, uh, build that. Uh, now that we have sort of the basic information that we wanted to pull out of the master model for this component, uh, maybe now we can start uh, adding some, uh, well here, we'll, we'll toss in a little counterbore on this back side. And do some extruding on that, maybe. All right, so now we have geometry that's being driven by the master model, but that we're still free to build on and, uh, and you know, add whatever 
whatever geometry that defines the, the final form of this a little bit better. Um, and obviously this is like the most basic form of something like this that we could do. This has absolutely no interaction with any other parts or, or really anything else that needs to be defined in here. Um, but you could continue doing that on each, on each part. And you can see if you take a look at this, same, same structure. We've got a master model that comes in, uh, gets inserted, gets locked in place, a new component gets created, a revolve happens. Um, you know, there's some additional stuff going on that's, uh, we're gonna pull geometry out of the master model to cut the slot and to cut this little uh, relief on the back side and to cut this overall pocket. Um, and you'll see like the same, the same structure happens on each of these and each one follows that same uh, insert the master model and build the, the individual features out of it, right? Um, so there's one for that. There's the actual button that I built up that looks more like this. Um, but then eventually you'll need to take all of those components and, and, uh, and re-cobble them together and make something that uh, you can actually check movement and check stuff like that with, right? So um, then you just make another new assembly, toss all of that stuff uh, start tossing all that stuff in here, right? And uh, just to kind of show one of the little perks of master modeling is that um, what's neat is that because it's being all defined in the same location and being driven by that master model, as we, this is the new one that we just added, as we insert something like the button in here, you'll see that it inherently comes in place, right? It comes in in the right location. Uh, and it makes life really simple for building things like an as-built joint, or actually, uh, an as-built joint between something like these, and maybe that has simpler, uh, some simple motion to it, right? Um, and I think that that's one of the things that I, uh, I think really helps clarify the purpose of an as-built as joint versus a joint is that uh, specifically for this technique, you really just don't ever wind up needing a standard joint. An as-built joint really is kind of the thing that you're looking for because you've already built the things in place. Um, um, so yeah, I, th I think that uh, you, you can you can quickly start to see that like I don't need to be the only person touching this body part, right? Somebody else can. <laughs> That was a funny statement. Uh, somebody else could come in here and be doing work on this while I'm uh, independently working on this advancing mechanism. We, we don't really have any uh, conflict there. We can, we can split that work up. Um, you can see that at the end of this, we'll, we'll wind up with uh, a bunch of independent components in here. Uh, so as our cam floats out, it's sort of consolidated more cleanly into these individual parts. Um, so this kind of solves a lot of that stuff. Um, I do think there are two primary drawbacks here. Uh, I think the biggest one is the performance of get latest of the get latest command, particularly if you're uh, online. Uh, you can see here I'm actually I'm actually forced to be offline, um, and it's because uh, if we come in here and take a look, the the get latest performance is significantly improved. Um, and we'll just make a change that this will this should affect affect everything on the whole model. You saw this pocket move. This this slot actually got a little bit sh shorter as well. Um, that's basically going to affect every single part. And so, if we make that change, hit save, and then say we pop into the body, you'll see now that the component's out of date. We can update it and get the latest. And it's not so bad on here, um, primarily because I'm offline. Um, and, and like that, that took a few seconds. Uh, it tends to take something closer to 15 to 30 seconds, at least for me when I'm online, you can see how quickly that rebuilt, which was pretty nice and clean. Um, we can grab the button and do a quick rebuild on it. Uh, then we need to go through and hit save on each of these things. And then we can pop into our checking assembly, which is also showing some stuff that's out of date. And also that I never actually updated the new button. Uh, but we can get latest on that as well. And, and like I said, it's, it's really not so bad and this seems to work a whole heck of a lot better when it's local. Uh, I think cloud performance between it needing to uh, pull down new copies of the files from the cloud, save them, upload them uh, repeatedly, 
uh, that really just kills performance. So that, that can definitely be a drawback. I've found that working offline solves that uh, really, really well. Um, kind of the second thing is I think I showed uh, we have change for we have the change parameters. I've been defining a lot of stuff with parameters. Uh, it really bugs me that I can't uh, or that those don't follow the master model into the uh, into their subcomponents or into the individual components. Uh, and the reason is that we can define a lot of stuff using sketches, uh, but there are other things that maybe. Uh, like an extrude or a revolve or something like that that would maybe want a parameter driving it as well or uh, I think the easiest example is like in this in this assembly I changed the amount of travel in the master model that this thing has I went from 0.2 down to 0.15 as my change um, and ideally I'd be able to link that up uh, into these joint limits uh, oops that's not the right into these joint limits so that that would all, you can see previously it was 0.2 and I changed it to be 0.15. And so now this joint's still allowed to be too far. Uh, if, if that, if the parameters followed the master model through, uh, then I'd be able to pull that in and use it in my slider joint. Um, and, and there's various places where that's true. And uh, like, that's probably the simplest, simplest version of that usage. Um, but so those those two things are kind of the two drawbacks that I can see with using this. Uh, I think it's something that really opens up a lot of freedom otherwise, so it's it's still worth those two little caveats. And, and honestly, at least one of them should be, uh, I, I would hope both of them can be mitigated or improved. Um, another uh, thing that tends to be pretty helpful is, uh, is also this, uh, what we did here, which is that the um, kind of this opens up some freedom to do uh, configurations or tr maybe try out some various things like right now we simultaneously have two different versions of this button part that still link back to the original master model and are still parametrically driven uh, but we can try different stuff out there um, a good example of some of that too is like uh, this is actually a change that I know that I want to make here um, is is maybe to change from this this style where um, where I'm grabbing the, let's see if I have a section in here, uh, where right now this is grabbing the, the pen refill on the outside, but these pen refills actually have this little boss on the inside. And so maybe this is something where I want to try this both ways and simultaneously have a second version of the part, uh, which is made pretty easy because we can just come in here, we can do a save as, change, you know, make the change to the part. Uh, reinsert it into the checking assembly and simultaneously have two parametrically updatable uh, versions of the same part. Um, so I think those are some of the strengths of this master modeling arrangement. Um, it's something that I've really found solves um, most of the problems that I've run into or most of the things that I've run to across my CAD career or, or things that I've just wondered how somebody mitigates an issue. Um, this is kind of how places handle this. Um, and I, and I think I, I was pleasantly surprised by how applicable it is with Infusion. So um, take a look. Hopefully people have some feedback. Hopefully maybe people are using this and have some tips that I can use as well. Like I said, I'm still, I'm still just kind of uh, wading into the waters of Fusion. I've, I've uh, used it for a few projects, but it's still not my primary CAD. Uh, so uh, if, if you're somebody who's using this, and I, I'm kind of assuming that anybody who's building something like a motorcycle or like a, a car or something like that, uh, or, or any teams that are working together, this is probably how they're working and that it's, it's probably working okay for them. But uh, with that said, I think there's a lot of people with a lot more experience doing that out there. Hopefully some of those people will kind of pop to the surface and give their uh, opinions on where this works or where uh, maybe there's some other issues that I haven't run into yet. So um, anyway, with that, uh, have a good one. Thank you.